Hi, I'm Christian Griego, and today I'm joined by Peter Ellison of Indiana University, mm -hmm. and you are the professor of music there? Professor of music, specializing in trombone. So how long have you been there? I just finished 21 years. It's a long time. It is a long time. Has it gone quick? Yes, uh, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> some years are a little longer than others. <laughs> some, some hours are a little longer than others. Um, no, it's gone by just like crazy. I just can't believe it's been 21 years. Now, um, I met you first in Nyack, I think. That's right, yeah. At the Alessi seminar back, back when it was in Nyack, uh -huh. back in the day. Yeah. And before that, you were, I knew of you just through rumor, the rumor mill or the, the trombone community. You were in Chicago. And before that, you were in Seattle? Yes, I played 10 years in the Seattle Symphony. Okay, so now we're going backwards. And before Seattle, you were? Oof. Well, before Seattle, I was doing doctoral work at Indiana University. Wow. Yeah, because I'd, I'd taken a lot of auditions and I'd gotten close a few times. And um, I thought, well, you know, if I can't get an orchestra job, I might as well go back to school, get a doctorate and find a teaching job. And so that's it's kind of ironic because when I went back to school for the to get a, a doctorate, that's when I actually got the orchestra job. So I think I think I had time to practice, uh, focus practice. And a lot of times with, with I, I've worked with a lot of college age through to their careers. Um, and I think that time, what you're buying is not just a degree or the education, it is that time. Right, absolutely. And that's something I tell my students is, you know, you really find out, you learn about yourself um, when, you, when you have time on your hands and, you know, uh, without, Without a, without a lesson to prepare for, without a, a, a class to prepare for, um, you know, when you have all this time, what will you do with it? And that's, that's when you, uh, you find out if you're really cut out to practice like crazy or not, when you well, don't have to. <laughs> well, and that, that's with dealing with COVID, we just had this again, where people had so much time on their hands and people either excelled uh -huh. or other people really struggled because they didn't have performances coming up. They didn't have a reason. And for me, I, I can't stay away from these instruments. <laughs> and I, I, I love it. And yeah. it, it always draws me back. Yeah. And it's the feeling, the feeling of, of resonating. And, but so you were, you, were, you were studying to get your doctorate, mm -hmm. and um, you were on the circuit with everyone else. Yes, I was. I started on the circuit in... I remember my first audition was December 23rd, 1984, for the uh, San Diego Symphony. That was the first audition that I took. Um, and uh, it was an interesting date that they chose to have an audition, you know, two mm -hmm. days before Christmas. Um, and yeah, for, for, you know, five years or so, uh, maybe long, longer than that. Yeah, I was just out on the, on the circuit. And I, I made the finals a few times, and, um, and I won a couple of jobs along the way. I won mm -hmm. a, a solo trombone in the Barcelona Orchestra in Spain in 1989. I won a job in the President's Own when they, back in the day when they used to have a trombone soloist oh position. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, maybe that was 1986-ish, uh, something like that. And I, I didn't take either one of them because I, <laughs> I wanted to play I wanted to play in an orchestra. I wanted to play in the, an orchestra in, in the U.S. So interesting. The, the solo position, they still have that position in a lot of European orchestras. Maybe, yeah, I think so. Oh, it's called solo. Yeah, it's called solo, solo, trombone, solo, posana. Yeah. yeah. It's just, yeah. Um, so from the time you won the principal, it was the principal position in Seattle? No, I was second trombone. You were yeah. second. Okay. So... You went in as second. Now, I was talking to you earlier about your ability to be what I, I call a chameleon. And I mean this in a, a very positive way. Many people, they, they can play in a certain orchestra, but if you put them out of that orchestra, it's very apparent it, it, the shoe doesn't fit as well mm. as with certain orchestras. Right. Um, but you've, you, can, you, can you tell us how you've first honed this ability to be able to sit with Chicago, New York, 
Seattle, or anywhere. I'll see that you've just performed somewhere and you have this ability to, to and how, how do you hone that craft to be able to play with such different styles of orchestras? Well, I was thinking about that um, yesterday and I was actually talking with my wife about that and she said, you know, part of the skill that she believes that I have is, was developed by listening, doing a lot of listening when I was young listening to different orchestras, listening to music all the time. And I've developed a sense of, you know, of just being able to hear well. And so then when you go and you play with these orchestras, um, it's actually really quite easy because you just, you hear what's going on and you just put it, and the easiest playing that I do, you know, was in the New York Philharmonic or the Chicago Symphony because everything is right, you know, le left to right. Every and all you have to do is put it in there. Right in the middle, you know, yeah. And, um, so, so, uh, you know, I think, A, you have to take the ego out of it and you'll have to be, you know, you have to be willing to, to adjust. Um, but I think I have, uh, maybe a, a, a special ability to be able to just adjust without even knowing I'm adjusting. It just happens. Well, and I met you more as a, a solo player to begin with, because in that role, as you were, you were teaching, uh, the, the, the fellows at the, uh, at the Alessi seminar, mm -hmm. and you were playing solos. And so I knew you first and foremost for that. And it's interesting to, uh, being, do you think being a second trombone player and having to listen both ways, left and right, helped you with oh, that craft? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, because you're, 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 you're adjusting everything all the time. You're adjusting your dynamic, you're adjusting your intonation, uh, you're, you're adjusting your, your articulation, your note lengths to, to be, you know, to match, you know, what's going on on the, the left and right. Yeah. And a lot of times principal players will, will have more to do with the trumpet mm -hmm. and that timbre. And yeah. so they may be listening right. Uh -huh. it, obviously it depends where, how, how <laughs> the stage is set up. But a lot of time the principal player, and I'm very conscious about that, the color of that tenor principle will have to have a little bit more sparkle to go towards the trumpet. Yes. Then the second player is listening both directions, and that's yeah. that. I think I find that to be one of the toughest jobs. Yeah. Second. Yeah. Well, you're 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 a bridge. Um, you know, you you have to you have to fill in the gap. You know, yeah. and I think you know you think about some of these really great trombone sections. Um, these great trombone sections have really great second trombone players. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what I think really makes a great a great section. Of course, I'm biased by saying that, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it's a second trombone that really can really make a, a trombone section sound great. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're in Seattle, and at that point, you did something crazy. That's how I would have perceived it. You <laughs> you you decided to leave and pursue something different. Can you tell me about that that decision? And sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I was fairly young to be, to leave an orchestra position and go to a, a teaching position, particularly one like Indiana University, that's fairly significant. Um, but I, and I, when I threw my hat in the ring for, uh, to be considered for the job at Indiana, um, I really had no idea that I would actually be successful in getting it. I just knew that somewhere down the road, I would like to have a teaching job, and so in order, I, I just did it to learn about the process. Mm -hmm. And I went through the process, and I ended up getting, ended up, you know, getting the position. And then it's like, okay, well, uh, you know, there was that phrase, better, you know, was it be better ten years too early than five minutes too late, or something like yeah. that. And I, honestly, uh, all kidding aside, I didn't know if anything that good would ever come my way again. And so I just, I, I went for it. And it's like going home because you were studying there. I had been there, yeah. And I, so yeah. It, being able to, who, who were you taking over for? Well, it was um, in the, the lineage, it was uh, Keith Brown's position that then Scott Hartman had for a, a time. And then there were two interims, uh, Jiggs Wiggum oh my taught, gosh, yeah. taught there for a year, yeah. and uh, a bass trombone player by the name of Albert Zyderdan. Yeah. Uh, taught there for for a year and then 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 I was uh, they had the search and I, I got the position so how how was it professionally moving from being a full-time orchestral trombonist to being a full-time professor Th this, is a, this is a great question because you know I thought oh I'm, I'll be going from a 
you know, going to a, a cushy teaching job, you know, cushy <laughs> teaching yeah. job, you know, because when you think about it, a trombone player in an orchestra, you know, you really only have to pay attention about 25% of the time. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, really, particularly when you're playing repertoire that you've played over and over again. Um, and, you know, we don't play that, we don't play that much. And so you're, you, there's a lot of time, downtime, mental downtime when you're on the stage. I mean, you're always, I mean, that's, that's a terrible thing. We're always alert and 100%. You were stage. counting measures like yeah. no other. Yeah. So, <laughs> so exactly. And so, but, so I thought, oh, this, this will actually be easy. And the first couple months of teaching, I'd never been so tired in my life. Really? Because the yeah. students, you know, they want to know what you know. Yes. And they're just on you, uh, mm -hmm. on you to, to learn, learn, you know. And so, um, you know, and of course now I've whittled it down, so I only pay attention 25% of the time <laughs> during my lessons. Not well, you're 75% more efficient. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it, yeah. Um, so, so, and curiously, once I left Seattle, and got out of the upper left-hand corner of the country. You know, Seattle's a little bit room. That's when I started to work with Chicago and mm -hmm. New York, and because I had better uh, flexibility with my schedule, um, and I was in the sort of the center of the country, and so I could go all these different places. So it really was after I left Seattle that I was able to start this, uh, you know, playing with the, the big big orchestras. Now, how did you get in with these orchestras? I mean, did you, was it networking or was it, did you, I mean, did you take sub auditions? I'm, I'm kind of curious, how does one? Yeah, well, that's a, that's also a great question. Um, and people want to know this, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Um, well, with Chicago, um, I mean, I knew those guys because I'd gone to school at Northwestern um, and I knew those guys and, uh, and I think the fact that I was just, and, and they knew me, I think the fact that I was closer to Chicago made it, uh, you know, more um, uh, logistically possible for me to come for me to come and play. Um, there was no, there was no, my audition. I guess was uh, you know playing you know, Great Gate uh, with that was my first concert with Chicago Symphony was playing you know Millennium Park playing you know the Great Gate of Kiev. You know it's like okay, well here we go, and uh, and and then. Pretty much steadily for ten years or so. I mean, that was their first call, you know, extra and sub. And with New York, I had known, uh, you know, Joe Alessi from the from the uh, the seminars, mm -hmm. and, and I attended the the very first Alessi seminar in 1999. I was a I was a participant uh, in that, and uh, yeah, that was a rough one. Yep, and um, um, and so, uh, and I mean that in the most positive way. It was. Morning, it was like boot camp. Oh, Morning rough. to midnight, yeah. people were trying to find time to pray. It, it hadn't been sculpted into what it is the last few times. Right, yeah, yeah. And so the time on the face was insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what a great experience. I mean, that's what really lit my fire as far as you know, playing solos and being, uh, you know, planning recitals and going here and going there was that was having participated in that first that Alessi seminar. Then, interestingly, in uh, 2003, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Indiana University commissioned uh, Eric Iwazin, and through John Whitaker, our, our mm -hmm. mutual friend, uh, commissioned Eric Iwazin to write uh, a concerto for Joe, and which is known as Visions of Light. Yep. And so Joe came to uh, to campus, and you know was there for several days, and it was. Uh, during one of those recitals, and I, I played uh, I played the Creston Fantasy, and uh, I had a good outing on it. Uh, you know, you never quite know what that outing is going to be. I had a good outing on it, and then after that, and J Joe heard that, and uh, and then I, I started um, started to work with the, with the Philharmonic after that. So it's it's really interesting for me to see to look back now, and see how the roads turn right and left, and if you choose to turn right or you choose to turn left how different the outcome can be. Absolutely. There's a, there's a movie, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, called uh, Sliding Doors, that it, uh, it deals with, you know, she missed, she missed the usual subway train that she usually got on, and she got on another one, and she met somebody, and it's like, and then the, the whole movie is spent comparing what, those, what her life would have been like had she made that first subway. It's, it's, it's a pretty fascinating move, but that, you're right about the turn left, turn right. 
you know? Right. We can connect the dots in reverse. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, doing all these things and now, now teaching the next generation, I mean, we were just, I just visited IU where we had the Boston Symphony out. Yes, yes. And two of the players were alums. Yes. Toby and Steve. Right. And watching their expression, watching their faces and, and their stories, we'd go to dinner and they would talk about their times there. Yeah. And they would go out even to just see the, the, the halls or the rooms that they would practice and go to. Yeah. And, and seeing, it's amazing how many people have been through IU. It's a big school. And it, I mean, it's amazing to see the facility and just the quality of students what is the over the, the 21 years mm -hmm. of being there? What has been the biggest change in 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 students, and what can what can students today do to improve more so than students of 20? Because 21 years ago, we didn't have all these distractions. Bingo. And Device distraction. The and the access. Yes, instantly to just pull it up on your phone, you have it. see it, read it, yep. and it may not pertain to that one student. How do you control so that it's, it's pertinent to that one student? Well, you know, all I can do is I can guide them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, going back to your earlier question, what I've seen over the past 21 years mm -hmm. is the, the, uh, the development of social media yeah. and, and devices and the addiction that, that you know, we all have to our devices. I mean, we, we, we have to learn how to manage our addiction. And I, you know, when I was, when I, this was first becoming, um, uh, when I was realizing this, you know, maybe 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, you know, I was trying to shut it down. I said, mm -hmm. you know, but the longer I went on, the more I realized it's here to stay and we have to manage it. You know, that's because I think about, you know, I think about Joe Alessi and Mark Lawrence and Michael Mulcahy and Charlie Vernon and Jim Markey and, you know, I just go on and on and on. The, all these people got to be great before devices and social media. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, I think it's lots of people are just really distracted. I mean, you, you said the word distraction. Yeah. So, and I, I'm, I'm very cautious with how much, and I, I, I'm the first, I, I love my phone. I mean, I get so- I love your phone too. Because <laughs> <laughs> you answer it. <laughs> yeah, well no, when well, that's the thing. I, I don't want opportunities to, to go by. Yeah. And so if the phone rings, I have the, the old freelance mentality was, you know, you, back in the day we had a pager because we were optimists. Oh, yeah, yeah, Somebody's yeah. gonna need to reach a trombone player yeah. in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> uh, it could happen. <laughs> But no, I, you don't want to miss out on opportunities, and you have to be able to, to accept those. But the, the phone, it, it's hard. And, I, and even sitting here with you, I found myself wanting to reach for my yeah, pocket to see yeah. if I had. And it's, it's crazy. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here in the middle of an interview, and I'm like, oh, it's not there, because I, yeah. I left it over yeah. here. And you know, the, the times when you, you go out and you leave your phone at home, or it's like, it's like the whole time you're thinking that, you know, the president of the United States is trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> you know? So you made a, uh, you, you're not on social media. No. Can you talk a little bit about that? I was on social media for a year, 2010 to 11, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I found that it was not contributing anything positive to my life. Yeah. And so I left. Yeah. Um, and so I'm a little bit of a, you know, an outlier in that because, you know, lots of people are on social media and there, there are, there are positives to social media. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But there are a lot of negatives and I'm seeing that, you know, with, with the students too, and just sort of, you know, how sort of neurotic they are about, about, um, what other people think of them. And, you know, so, um, no, I'm not, I'm not on social media and there are times when I think about j joining and then I think back to why I left and I'm reminded why, why I'm not. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, now, old. I'm old. You have three albums out now. I do. Uh, what, what are they titled? Uh, first one is called Pura Vida. Mm -hmm. because for Costa Rica. For, from the, my, yeah. our, our association with the, the trombonists de Costa Rica. The second album is called uh, In the Manner of Defe. Mm -hmm. 
um, where I pair the six character pieces of Defay uh, that he wrote in the manner of, you know, in the manner of uh, Vivaldi, manner of Bach, etc., with a piece paired with a piece by mm -hmm. by Bach, and then my third one out is called Three, mm -hmm. um, and I called it Three because I'm a big Chicago fan, and so you know how they they number their albums, mm -hmm. and so they just called it Three, and Four is Four is in the can, so yeah, yeah, so. I got a call from you a while back, <laughs> and um, we've, we've known each other, we've worked together on and off over the past 20 years, and uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what we were discussing? Sure. Um, this will be, you know, I have to be, be a little bit careful here, but, um, you know, I, I basically have, you know, have, have Developed my whole career playing a certain style of instrument, mm -hmm. and from a you know from a certain manufacturer, and um, and as you said, there have been times when I've <clears throat> you've been very gracious in allowing me to come and try things, and and uh, sometimes for extended periods of time, and I I would always end up going back, mm -hmm. run, run back to Mama, yep. you know, to my 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 previous instrument, and um, and I think there are. Are, there were several um, sort of uh, contributing factors that I wanted to uh, explore a different avenue and come and come back because you have been so helpful and um, o over the years and uh, and your door has always been open to me and so uh, you know I felt you know I felt like uh, I was welcome to yeah. contact you and, and, and to, to, to try again. And, you know, we've, we've worked together on various projects uh, over, over the time. And, and uh, yeah, and so it was, uh, I would say that's, you know, that's why I, I came back. To what's, what's interesting is uh, with Pete and myself, we, we worked on the, the original 4047 mm. together, the 4047 DS Getson. And from that, over the years, it, that was back when we were outsourcing our rotors. Uh, we would get them in, then we'd remachine re the rotors and change the insides. Um, but since then, we've started manufacturing our own rotors, and I made some adjustments in the knuckles um, in, in the, um, uh, the way the air would go through. And, and it was interesting, when, from that original 4047, the idea was to make a, a, a more consistent um, Bach, yeah. and that's and Bach is an, a great American trombone, and I really respect everything that they've done. But we the consistency has um, always varied in such a way that um, I wanted to come up with a Bach-like instrument that was more consistent and could be produced consistently. Because the more interaction a, a human has with the instrument, the more chance of things being different. Um, because there's more buffing, there's more hand work, there's more hand ragging, there's more, and so keeping it as simple as possible with the overall concept of sound. And when I wanted to work with you from a selfish standpoint, because I wanted to understand that sound. Mm -hmm. And I knew you had went through 50 or 60 instruments to find your chosen one. And it was not just the bell section, it was the tuning slides, the F, the, the slides, everything. Right. And so you had some very unique things about yours that, was, that made it interesting for me. And I, um, just like whenever I originally worked with the, started working with the St. Louis Symphony, they were, at that point they were all on green hose. And I, I was working on the, the 396 and the 502s, and I was going after a higher compression valve instrument and I needed to understand it. So working with them allowed me to understand uh -huh. that. Yeah. Working with you allowed me to understand, because uh, you already had such a head start on that concept of sound uh -huh. and feel yeah. that I, I couldn't possibly, I can't get that, um, at that point, 40 years probably, 45 years, at that point you'd been playing this style of instrument. So it helps me to just go to the source yeah. of someone who's been through the ringer Chasing down the unicorns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was that was the sound that I had in my head. You know, when I was when I was in school, you know, I was listening to the Chicago Symphony. And of course, was, you know, yeah. and I was listening to um, you know the New York Philharmonic, and they were all playing Bach instruments, yeah. and that that's 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 what I had, and that's that's what I constantly pursued. And 
the frustrating part for me was I couldn't send a student to a music store yeah. to go buy the instrument that I had because yeah. because uh, there was just there's just a difficulty and there's with uh, consistency. And so with the Getson 4047, I think we've now with the the since. When I started working with Enzo, we had learned of, of some other techniques with the sheet tuning slides being more consistent all the way um, from the small side of the tuning slide all the way to the big, the material is more consistent in thickness. Mm -hmm. Where when we were originally working, we had tube, and I think, so now the color is a little bit more expansive. Agreed. And the response is a little bit more crystalline. Yes. It just in, it's just yeah. right there. Yeah. And there's some things we've, with the rotors, the tuning slide, and the, just these small things. This last time when uh, yourself and John came up and we went through it again, it was much easier to hone in on the exact feel and sound. Yeah. And even, can you talk about why you're here this time? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I'm here this time because uh, I wanted to get additional 4047 ETs uh, because I am, uh, because air, traveling through the airport in Indianapolis has suddenly become, with the new scanning machines, has suddenly become a little bit arduous. Uh, and so I want to, I want instruments. Uh, I, I split my time in Washington, Washington D.C., where my wife lives, and uh, so I want an instrument there. Mm -hmm. So I don't, don't have to fly back and forth. And I want an instrument for my studio. And I want an instrument at home. Well, and it's <laughs> it's crucial to have a backup instrument, and I'm I, I, shocked. I've always, I've always had to. Yeah, I am really. shocked by the amount of professionals that don't have a yeah. backup instrument. And if you don't, that's dangerous. Yeah. Because something will happen. Yeah, and you're sunk. And you have a job in two and a half hours that you were getting ready to go to, and something happened to your instrument. Yep. And so I, it's, it's it may not be the same quality, but you need to have a backup instrument if you're a professional. That's something that you're comfortable with. Yes. That's something that you can get the job done, um, you know, whether your horn is stolen, whether, you know, it's, somebody knocks it off a stand, it gets damaged somehow. Um, it's really important to have a second instrument. So why don't you just get a travel bell? Um, because I am afraid of that big old weight right there. Um, that's why. That's really that's that's the I'm and it it's, it it must be heavier. Just it has to be heavier because it got that extra thing of, of brass there. It's a little over a quarter pound. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then it, so that and and I also I'm wondering if uh, if it has an adverse effect on just the the resonance of the bell having that there so you can you can graph that and anyone can record um with e any device now and you can see the the differences in overtones and mm -hmm. there it's pretty dramatic yeah so um uh, i'm still trying to find the tra the travel bell solution that doesn't add too much weight and doesn't affect the overtone structure if we could keep the resonance the same, I'm okay with it. Can you it. make a carbon fiber? Uh... I've made one before, and um, uh, it, it didn't work in certain regards, but I, I'm, now I'm on to the next st stage there because I, I think that um, th from the weight standpoint, it's there, but the, the prepreg that it uses and the, the, um, the binding agents are very non-resonant, um, which is why they're used um, in a lot of times in... Um, where they need things need to be dampened because it will absorb very oh, okay. well, uh -huh. even okay. even if you're on um, uh, if you're coming in from outer space and you you don't want resonances because that causes vibration. Resonance equals vibration, uh -huh. so they use a lot of on the leading edge. Um, they have carbon fiber because yeah, heat dissipation it doesn't absorb, but it also will cancel vibration resonances. Okay which uh, last time I checked, we need resonances. Yeah, resonance is a good thing on the trombone. And, and yeah. so everyone can say that carbon fiber, uh, I mean, there are some carbon fiber trombones out there. They're interesting for people that need lightweight solutions, uh -huh. but they don't resonate in the same fashion as historical instruments, which is what we do. We make historical instruments, yeah. which are beautiful. So um, I really appreciate your input from as far back as 20 years ago on the original 4047. Yeah. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to proceed forward and even end up with the 4047 ET, which we have yeah. now, yeah. which is just beautiful. And I was just thinking, I, I, I played the 4047. Uh, I snuck it into the Chicago Symphony uh, 20 years ago or wh whatever it was, you know, um, uh, and played a, played a concert on it. So it was, it was, uh, it was great.
So you're not on social media. We've covered that. But what's your website? PeterEllison.com. So go to PeterEllison.com and you update that with yeah. all your recordings. Yeah, there's, there's information there. I don't update it as often as I should, but I have blog posts there. I have... You know, the, I have my warm-ups that I put on there. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, you know, my, uh, s my syllabi from, uh, from school and my um, lesson routine that I have my students do. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's a lot of information on, the, on that website. So, yeah, drop on by. Well, thanks for being here. And we'll see you around. All right, man. It's great to be here.